The January transfer is barely open, and already Ricardo Pepe and Daryl DK have joined the growing legion of Americans across the pond as each looks to take his game to the next level in this World Cup year of our Lord, 2022. I'm Heath Pierce, and I'm joined by Jimmy Conrad, as usual, to weigh up the pros and cons of the aforementioned transfers before we dive into our Yanks Abroad Power Rankings. The USMNT Hour begins right now. Now, if you're watching this live on YouTube, get in the comment section, share your thoughts, share your concerns, share your hot takes if you want. Our producer will throw them up on the screen. Get involved in the conversation. We love it. It makes the conversation better for us. We have more fun when you guys join us on this journey. And this is a YouTube exclusive, by the way, but make sure you're subscribed to the Kegel Lasso podcast wherever you get your podcast and take a minute to leave a glowing review. It helps us get found. It helps us to continue to make free episodes for you guys and builds our community to be even bigger and better than before. And a life hack, you can do that right now while you listen. And all of those, uh, um, by the way, for those of you who listen to him podcast, if you listen to it on Spotify, you can now leave ratings on there. So go give Kay Golasso a five-star review if you enjoy the show. Anyways, Jimmy Conrad, what is going on, man? It's good to see you again. Happy New Year, everybody. Let's get after it. Let's talk about some of the U.S. men's national team. We're ready to talk a little soccer with everybody. We call it soccer over here because it's awesome. I'm yeah. excited. I'm excited. Because it's, uh, it's awesome. It's <laughs> uh, now, Jimmy, we're in a World Cup year, by the way. Uh, yes. This is our, our first USMNT hour uh, of the year of our Lord 2022, the World Cup year in which we uh, start to dominate the world. Isn't that how this goes, or is that still a few years out? Well, no. We, I, you know what we can say is that a year from now, we can be sitting uh -huh. here smoking cigars here on the U.S. Men's National Team Hour because uh -huh. we're celebrating the fact that we are World Cup champions. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go, boys. Okay, maybe maybe 2026. I, I don't, you know what? It's it's in, in the near future, we're going to be World Cup champions, and every part of the world outside of us is going to hate us because they definitely do not want us to win a World Cup. They will. We'll be, they we'll be insufferable. We'll be insufferable. Yeah. It, they will hate us eventually. <laughs> It'll be the best thing that ever happened uh, to all of us. Now, Jimmy, before we get into... A number of things, including transfer news, and we're going to do our uh, Yanks Abroad Power Rankings. we got to talk a little bit about news stateside, speaking about the national team. We can't leave out Steve Chirundolo, named as the new manager of Los Angeles Football Club. For anybody who doesn't know, Steve Chirundolo uh, was in Germany, did some stuff with the youth national teams as part of some different youth setups, was also an assistant at the first team level in the Bundesliga, then was most recently with the Las Vegas Lights, uh, who are the affiliate of, of the Los Angeles Football Club, when, uh, when uh, Bob Bradley left to go to Toronto, where they parted, mutually parted ways. Steve Trenolo now got the job. What's your take on this, Jimmy? Uh, frankly, a little bit surprised, if only mm -hmm. because it felt like Steve was a little bit new to the U.S. soccer scene in this country. Obviously, he's been retired for, for some time. He's got his UEFA Pro license. He is completely equipped to be a top manager but he just hadn't taken that ah that swim in the in the high seas of how it works here in this country which is a little bit different than everywhere else even though he was aware of it he didn't play in MLS he didn't uh he hasn't coached in MLS but he when he took the Las Vegas Lights job at the USL level I thought ha huh, that's an interesting hire and immediately wasn't that surprising message. to you wasn't that, that was surprising, surprising to you as well it was surprising they took the Las Vegas Lights job but there must have been something bigger going that, hey, by the way, you know, he's friends with Bob. Maybe there, yeah. this could be, you know, Bob could probably see it for what it is. I, I don't think I'm going to be here much longer, whether I have success or not. Maybe my time here is over. They're going to have a new voice, new blood come in. And if you position yourself correctly and get here early enough and they get used to you and get to see what you're capable of, maybe you could be a candidate for the job. That's exactly how it played out. And he got the job. He beat out Ante Razov, who was a longtime assistant for Bob who I don't know if he's going to stay with Trundle or not. I haven't heard about his future or who Trundle is going to bring in for his staff. But I was a little bit surprised because Jesse Marsh could have been a late gasp. Why not bring Jesse Marsh back into the team? So I, I like it. I think Steve is one of the smartest players that I ever played with. He just knows the game inside and out. I think he's a great communicator. And I think what I really like about him is that he's a great human being. So, so he's going to speak to you like a human being. There are some coaches out there that treat everybody like robots and that they don't have feelings and all that. And I think Chirondolo will come at it in a different way, and I think he'll really be able to relate to some of the younger players in particular. I think this is a great hire. I just hope he gets off to a great start, because sometimes if you don't get off to a great start as a manager, eh, it gets a little squeaky bum time there for a while. But what are your thoughts on this? 
Yeah, I like it. I, I like it, uh, one, because we, we know Steve, so obviously we're a little bit biased to the fact that we know his character, and I think that, that wins out in a lot of ways. We know his leadership qualities, and that wins out in a lot of ways. And sometimes you can see a player that you play with, and you go, okay, that's going to be a good manager. You know, that guy's kind of got it figured out. He has an ability to communicate. He has an ability to deliver messages, motivate, those types of things. All those intangibles, I think, we're going to work in his favor to become uh, a head coach. Now, I, I'm, I'm worried about his lack of experience. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, he's spent you can pretty much consider him a foreign coach in the fact that he spent the majority of his time at, well, all of his time as a professional athlete. And then his coaching experience all abroad, not having to deal with the U S soccer system, including as a player, right? Understanding the complex complexities of the league and how money moves. But obviously he's got John Thorrington next to him. Who's, who's got the experience that's going to help guide him. He was with the Las Vegas lights and they were doing, they were training in Los Angeles and they would go out to Las Vegas for the matches. And so he was close to the club enough that I trust that he's got a, a grip on it. Again, I think he lacks a little bit of that experience that we'd like. But part of me also enjoys the fact that it's not just the MLS coaching carousel where it's right. just the same guy coming back in again. I think Jesse Marshall lands somewhere. I think he was probably too close to Bob Bradley. But overall, I think uh, uh, a solid move. Again, I just hope he, he ends up well. The bar has been set really high for LAFC. And I think, again, we've talked about this before on the show, where I think they need to now build a little bit more of a foundation with their youth players developing, if you saw, when the U.S. played Mexico in the U-20s, um, uh, th there was a number of dual nationals coming out of Los Angeles, and that's a hotbed for talent that I think that LAFC need to be able to continue to tap into, develop, and bring them into the first team. Um, but, Jimmy, uh, Maloko is asking what squeaky bum time means. Uh, squeaky bum time is what they used to call, what, under, like under Ferguson, Sir Alex Ferguson. It's when those, like, last couple minutes where you've got a lead, you're trying to hold on to it, and you just know it's going to be nerve-wracking. And over in the UK, they call it, you know, your, your bum gets a little squeaky, right? Because you're so yeah, nervous yeah. and you might yeah. crap your pants. So so that's what squeaky bum time is. And I just stole the phrase and made it my own because I think it's super funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's Sir that's Alex it. Ferguson going to do? Is he going to sue you? Come on. No, he's not going to. No. no, he's not going to sue me. Yeah. Okay, Jimmy. So let's move on to uh, transfer news. This is actually a really exciting kickoff to... The transfer season, especially for, for Major League Soccer players going abroad. Daryl DK, someone who you and I have been huge advocates of and have been quite critical of Greg Berhalter not calling him in, now goes back to the championship to a team, West Brom, who are fighting for promotion and aren't scoring a ton of goals in doing that. It seems like he's the player that they're trying to bring in to, to solve that problem. Now, we'll talk about his transfer versus Ricardo Pepe's and is, is Ricardo Pepe worth two and a half times DK and all that stuff, but just in general, what's your initial take on on the Daryl DK move to West Bromwich? Do you like it? Do you think he can be successful like he was during his loan stint at Barnsley? And just to give a little context to that, Jimmy, I was actually out here uh, out here in Dubai with with my college roommate. My college roommate's really good friends with Dane Murphy, and Dane Murphy, uh, part of the reason he got the job at Nottingham Forest was because of how well he did bringing in Daryl DK to Barnsley, and people thought, wow, he's got this network; he can see the game differently. And that's now translated to a new job and opportunity for him. And so, obviously, Daryl DK made the guy who brought him in look really, really good. And there's now a belief in him that's furthering his career. Well, I mean, what's your take on Daryl DK in general with this move and his ability to be successful in England? No, I think it's great. I think that there is a lot of positives to take from his sample size that he had with Barnsley. I think he had 19 games with them and scored nine goals. And... In a lot of ways, he would turn games on its head by himself, right? He would, mm -hmm. he would necessarily make something out of thin air, but he was getting on the end of crosses. He was scoring good goals. He was being and, and using his strengths to, to you know, in, in, a, in a positive way. And I think that he what really suits. Guy, by the way, can we just stop and look at this picture, Jimmy, on the screen? I, I don't know if you've spent much time talking to him, but he's the happiest man. He is such a sweet man that I just wish him. Nothing but the best. Sorry Same. to jump in there, but I see him giving the thumbs up, and I'm like, oh, he's actually really excited right here. And he's like a little boy in a, in a candy shop. Uh, thumbs up, excited to play. But, yeah, sorry. What Keep I going. appreciate is that it's not – it might be a loan with an option to buy, but I think that's already been decided or whatever. It's a permanent move, ultimately, for him to go. And I and I think that that there's no strings attached makes it better, that, that this feels a little bit more real. With Barnsley, he was on loan, and that always feels like – Am I really one of the guys? Are they really bringing me in to, to solve problems? Is it just a short-term solution? Am I just a Band-Aid to whatever's going on with this particular club in this particular moment? And now that he's getting that faith in a team that's fourth overall in the championship, I think it's awesome. I, I think that they're, that they're seeing what he's capable of at the championship level. 
uh, and what he'd already done with Barnsley really speaks to the impact that he had at that division. <coughs> Excuse me. And now it's time for him to kind of show up and do it again. To him as a human being, awesome. I have spent some time with him. He's such a sweetheart. He's, oh, yeah, he's really that's right. You were down in, uh, you were down in uh, Arizona with him recently or something like that, right? Weren't you yeah, well, I, yeah. I did do something with him. He's just so well-spoken. We've stayed yeah. connected uh, on Insta, and he, he's just – he can see things for what they are. He's got great awareness. He's, 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 he's so nice, you know? So when, yeah. I, it, at some point, you got to dig into your, your yeah. inner uh, anger, I think, when you're going up in the championship and you're getting kicked every single game. But he seems to have already handled that well. I would be, I guess, a little bit more fearful about how I thought he would do, even though I knew he was capable of it, without that sample size that he had at Barnsley. But because he's already proven his worth, I think that's going to allow him to well, transition into the team in a more meaningful way. Also, the coach that coaches West Brom was the same coach he had at Barnsley. So that's going to help out yeah. a lot too because he already knows what to say, how to push his buttons and all that. But if they can somehow get from West Brom and they get promoted up to the Premier League, I'm absolutely buzzing because the other U.S. men's national team player we have in the Premier League, Josh Sargent, not doing so hot. <laughs> you know what's funny? When I, when I, when I think about Daryl DK, I think about when – when Josie Altador was a young player, and he ended up at Hull, right, for part of his career, and I thought, wow, this could be a really good move for him because he's mm -hmm. a big physical body. But Josie was never – when Josie – when he planted his feet, you couldn't move him. But he wasn't always – like, Daryl DK loves the physical contact. He loves there being players around him, using bodies for him to, like, kind of create his own space and things like that. And he has that chaos. By the way, talk about small world. Valerian uh, Ismail, who's, who's the manager – of West Brom, who obviously got the goals out of him while he was at Barnsley, was a teammate of Steven Chirundolo to finish his career at uh, Hanover, which is just kind of crazy. So, like, uh, this is a USMNT show. No matter what we talk about, we've got the <laughs> tissue. Yeah, we always have uh, to have connect the dots. Yeah, yeah, going through all of that. But, yeah, I agree with you. I think this is a great move for him in terms of the next steps. And, and I agree also on loan deals. They feel like there's an added pressure on the player, almost like, oh, it's a moonshot. If they do exceed expectations, they'll stick around. I know the Barnsley one was built on 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 uh, them promoting. This one seems like a permanent move and one that I think will be really important for him. Let's uh, let's shift our, our our conversation over to Ricardo Pepe though. This one is a really bizarre to me uh, in a lot of ways, and we're, we we can take it. We can go a couple clicks deeper on this one if you want, Jimmy. But twenty million to Augsburg, a club that's fighting relegation. It's by far their biggest ever transfer. It's probably going to be the biggest, I would guess, one of the two, three biggest transfers in the January transfer window in all of the Bundesliga for a team that's struggling to score goals, that's fighting relegation, and they're taking this chance on an 18-year-old striker from the United States. Now, on one hand, I think this is amazing. On the other hand, I'm like, something doesn't feel right about this. What's your initial take on this one, Jimmy? Well... I love it too, just because I'm thinking about it from Ricardo Pepe's perspective. He comes into a team that's only scored 17 goals in their 17 games. Mm -hmm. They don't score a lot of goals, though they beat Bayern Munich recently 2-1, so there's something to hang their hat on. They just got a, a draw with RB Leipzig, even more recent than that, at 1-1. So they've got a team to compete. They seem pretty well organized, and I think that Ricardo Pepe's going to slide in and probably start and get some meaningful minutes. The other team that we were hearing a lot about, another Berg, Wolfsburg, we're also bandied about, and he was going to have to compete with Vout Veghorst. We thought that Florian Kofeld usually plays with one striker. Is he going to go to two to accommodate Pepe and Veghorst at the same time? That made me a little bit nervous because we want Pepe getting minutes where he's going to play for the U.S. men's national team, very similar to Daryl DK. If he does well for West Brom, hopefully that can get him back into, the, into camp and we can start to consider him in a more real way. So keep your eyes out on that for Greg Berhalter as he tries to get back on his radar. But with regard to Pepe, we need him to play that number nine spot. I want him to get better at the spot that he's going to play with our national team. Now, when I think about Augsburg overall, when they probably made this decision, I assume there was some marketing component to it because I guarantee you all the U S men's national team fans out there in the States that don't really pay attention to the club scene so much now know where Augsburg is. They know, know what Augsburg is about. And they're going to be paying attention to Augsburg in a way that they never have before. And I think that has to be taken into consideration. They're probably going to move some Augsburg jerseys because they can get one with Pepe on the back and that'll be supporting yeah. their club. So I see some marketing angles there. Very similar because I think we could sit here and say that Christian Pulisic was still probably overvalued for $75 million or whatever when he went to Chelsea with this in mind. Because he was probably more 50-60, but when you bring in the marketing component of how to get Americans to care about the sport, you got to have an American and play him. And I think Augsburg's maybe thinking about the same thing on a smaller scale.
Yeah. I, I mean, I look at it in two ways. Uh, remove, if you remove the transfer fee, I think it's a great move. A team mm -hmm. fighting relegation, an 18-year-old who's got that sort of golden touch, he could find his form, he could find his streak, and within six months he could be on his way out, right? Just mm -hmm. have a good mm -hmm. run of form. Or in a year and a half from now, he could be on his way out. But it's going to be an intense environment. You're going to be playing against players better than you every single day in training. You're going to now then on the weekend play against players better than the players that you have in your team mm -hmm. to challenge yourself and get better. And I think it's a perfect uh, scenario for a young striker. Now, on one hand, the 20 fee helps – Probably give him a bigger sample size if he's not scoring goals right away to know that this is we who we invested in. We need to keep going with him. If he's not scoring in three, four, five first games, they're going to keep giving him the chances as long as he's doing well. And we talk about him. He's going to step in right away, and you're going to see the the team's going to see the intangibles that he brings to the squad that help the team just automatically become better, whether he's whether he's scoring the goals or not. But the transfer fee worries me a little bit just in terms of the spread, the pressure in sure. terms of his mindset and what he's going to have to do. I mean. He's blown their transfer record out of the water, Jimmy. I mean, it's not like he's coming in as just the guy who was like one, two million like it would have been back in the day in MLS and you would have hoped for the best or Michael mm -hmm. Parker's going to Augsburg after a couple of years at, at FC Norseland, seven, eight years into his professional career. This is a guy who's basically played one full season as a professional and then 20 million off the jump to take him to a club that's not in the best of form right now. Just to me, it feels like I really hope, and you talked about this yesterday on the, on, on the Weekend Recap, Jimmy, was creating an environment for him where he has family, has a support system where he's going to go through the ebb and flow of a season but has that support to continue to get better and better and better and doesn't let the transfer fee, doesn't let the distractions because the media will absolutely murder him in, in, in Germany. No one's ever said something bad about Ricardo Pepe in his entire career up till now, right? He's only mm -hmm. read about uh, Phenom, Prodigy, the next greatest. I threw, I put him up on the pedestal. Everybody's talking about, okay, he had a little bit of a dry spell. People were critical of that. But that's nothing compared to what the media is like in Europe, right? Especially in a place like that where he's going to come into the locker room. All the newspapers are going to be there. Mm -hmm. People are going to be talking about it. I mean, there's a different level of pressure that comes with that. I just hope that he doesn't get caught in the vortex of that being so young, but all, but just takes all the benefits that come with being at a club like this. I mean, uh, do, do you disagree with this? No, I don't disagree. Uh, as someone who did have a little bit of a loan spell at Luck Poznan back in the day. And I know you've spent some time over in Europe and, and as you travel with the national team and you start to play in bigger games and more people are paying attention, it does change your perspective. It does change your disciplines and habits. I mean, you have to do a lot to not pay attention to that stuff. And when you're younger, and especially because of the evolution of social media and how easy everything is. And, and, and you know, this, you've been on social media and so is everybody else, right? You, you could have, be having a great day. You know, your, your photo that you're posting on Instagram gets a bunch of likes. And then somebody leaves a comment like, ah, oh, you look ugly or you suck, bro, you know, yeah. or whatever. And, and then that's what you think about the rest of the day, you know, and that's only going to be amplified times a thousand. Now, he already had a taste of that with the national team, right? He came out of nowhere, didn't have as much hype, then started to fulfill the hype for the national team. And as that started to grow a little bit, and I think as he had more time to think about what was actually happening, he, he stopped scoring. Not that he wasn't doing the little things. And I think that's what we like about him, right? Is that even if he's not scoring, he's still trying to have some type of impact on the game, whether that's running the channels, whether it's pressuring somebody, whether it's having good holdup play so it gets to the next player who then can set up the goal or, or score the goal themselves. He's very good at those little things. And I think these teams and why you'd want to pay $20 million for him is that because of those intangibles that don't always involve scoring. And then once he gets on his horse that is or once he gets going and firing on all cylinders and starts to relax and scoring goals I mean, he's definitely a rhythm guy when he's feeling good about himself he's going to score a lot but he always seems to get himself in good positions i like i like his movement in the box off the back shoulder of the defenders there's a lot to like about his game and so i'm excited to see though how he's going to deal with adversity and he's going right into a hotbed of adversity with augsburg who are fighting that relegation zone space and are struggling to score goals and as you know since you've been around and we've played in enough games heath when you're playing with a team that isn't scoring the goals that they should or, or just can't get those breaks that they thought that they created enough of to get results, it starts to pile on. And that little snowflake turns into a snowball and it's hard to get out of the way of that. And it's hard to, where do you generate confidence when you don't have any? And that's going to be a, a tough thing for him if it's not going well right off the start for, for you know, in him individually and then, of course, collectively as a group. Yeah. Let me ask you this, Jimmy. Do you, how much of this move to Augsburg do you think was driven by the transfer fee Versus driven by his team and FC Dallas and the pathway of his Ooh, career being a next step. I mean, it, it naturally at 20 million, you are eliminating most clubs who are not 
fundamentally positive that you are going to deliver for them or there's some larger thing at play that has maybe, you know, whether it's American ownership or some other thing that, mm-hmm. that, 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 that is woven into this. But to spend this much on a young American who I think will repay at a club that's fighting relega- relegation, how much of that do you think? Because you know, I, I, I use the example a lot of Chris, uh, Chris Mueller, right? And he's going to Hibs in this offseason. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he did well with the national team. And he had a great season two seasons ago uh, in Major League Soccer. And, and, they, and he was linked to a number of big clubs. And then you see that when it all comes down to it, he ends up at Hibs. And you go, well, is he going to Hibs because that was the only option? And mm-hmm. maybe he was leveraging it? Or did, did he feel that was the right next option? And maybe there was other options out there. Because I, I just don't see what other clubs were willing to spend this type of money. So how much do you think this is about uh, the club itself? And their and their funds versus you know because uh, to put it into context, I had two options when I was going into the Bundesliga. One where there was a Swiss international at Eintracht Frankfurt who was going to be playing, and I was going to have to fight for that. And he was going to transition out of the club later on, but I was focused on playing matches. Or I could go to Hansa Rostock, where I thought, at least in my mind, this is the next step. They need a left back. They need somebody to step in. And obviously, I learned quickly that none of that really means anything in the end. Um, you can't really trust these situations, but I took what I thought was the next step in my career and that the step after that would come. I mean, how much of that do you think is the step versus, versus the transfer fee? Uh, you'd like to think he's had more opportunities and other options. I'm sure they were weighing something. Now, at times it can be difficult to get your work permit to go to England, go to the championship, all that good stuff or, or premier league. And so I wonder if that was a deterrent at all. It was a deterrent for me when I was looking to make a move after the world cup. Had some Bundesliga teams interested in me, including the one that Steve Chirondolo was a part of at the time, Hanover. It ended up falling through at the last minute, but it's it's there was other options. I had Rosenborg, who at that point were in the Champions League. They ended up being in the group stages with Chelsea, uh, which was a bit of a bummer that I let go of that opportunity to to kind of see out the Bundesliga one. But I just thought, oh, I, I feel like I'm a Bundesliga level player. You know, I think I can hold my own in the Bundesliga and do well and thrive. And, and no disrespect to the Norwegian League, but but I want to be there and I want to be with a friend with Steve Chirundolo. So I'm sure there's a lot of different elements, right? You have these other options and you're weighing these things. I don't know if he let Greg Berhalter weigh in. I know that I was talking to Bob Bradley at the time, my national team coach, when these options were being presented to me. And he was very eager to to have players over in Europe in the player pool. So I could I knew where he was leaning. And I was trying to make it happen. It just didn't end up playing out that way. And uh I'd like to think though, when when he's weighing Wolfsburg versus Augsburg, let's just uh, we know those two for sure. I think minutes do matter. I mean, Wolfsburg are only two points ahead of Augsburg on the table. Augsburg do have some positive results recently, as I mentioned before. And you get to come in and kind of be the number one guy. I mean, their leading goal scorer is a 31-year-old attacking midfielder who's got three goals out of the 17. And that's not great. And they have a whole bunch of players on two, but they don't have an out-out number nine. And Wolfsburg already has that. So I could see the, the the draw to Augsburg, and they must be promising him something, right? Because Augsburg isn't a team that rolls off your tongue or the first, you know, let's say if you said, hey, Jimmy, name the, the, the best 100 teams in Europe. I don't think Augsburg, I just wouldn't think of them. You know what I mean? Well, I, so, also wouldn't, I also wouldn't think that they were a club that could spend $20 million on a that, player. That too, you know? that too. And so especially there's a on lot. an 18-year-old. I could see them spending $20 million on a Valt Vekhorst to go to your club because he's a proven goal scorer. Right. And he's, you need him now to keep you in the league versus an 18 year old. I mean, it just, it seems bizarre, but I do like your point. And when you compare it to Wolfsburg, I like Augsburg better for Ricardo. For sure. For sure. So, so I don't know, I guess we're gonna have to wait and see. I'm sure as time goes on, we're going to figure out or or hear more about his other options and what he did or didn't agree to. But uh, I don't know. It's interesting. And, And you're right. Augsburg again, were another team that I didn't think would be splashing 20 million on a young American talent. Yeah. But they're going to have their reasons, and I'm sure we'll find out more of them as time goes on. Well, for everybody that's watching this, would love for you guys to chime in and tell me which which move you think is better for the individual player. Do you think DK to uh, West Bromwich or or Pepe to Augsburg? Now that you've give, gotten a, a little bit of time to 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 see the context around these moves, you know, throw in the, the chat D for DK or P for Pepe if you think that Pepe's move is better. Now, Jimmy. Yes. They're not the only ones uh, that have that have moved so far. There's going to be more as as the month goes along. But let's talk about Caden Clark. You know, Caden Clark, for 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 everyone's reference, has been loaned back to the New York Red Bulls uh, until June. 
So he'll go back to the club until the summertime when the club uh, goes into their kind of summer break. It'll play him through the summer break as a young player. And then he'll be able to join the team uh, in the late summer, early fall when they go into their, ne- their, their preseason in the summer and then into the season. I mean, what's your, wh- what are you thinking about this type of thing? Do you think it was because of the fact that Red Bulls aren't in a great light right now and they thought, well, we're going to bring in this guy who wasn't quite ready anyway and we're going to bury him somewhere and it's not going to be great for his development where it's better for him to get more minutes and come in more primed and ready to go. A little more Brendan Aronson-like where you're going to get your games there and be able to step right into a, a new team with probably a new manager with some new signings and then be part of what is probably going to be uh, more puzzle pieces where you actually have a clearer picture. Or do you think this was just a matter of like, he's not ready yet, let's keep him, you know, he's keep, they're keeping him within the system. But I mean, what, what's, your, what's your takeaway from all this? I, I would be, I'm disappointed for Caden Clark. Obviously, there was a lot of excitement about him making that move and and taking that next step in his career i kind of wish that they would have loaned him out to rb salzburg instead so at least he could have seen this move to europe he could have had a friend already baked in i don't know if he's friends with ben and aronson or not but at least another american who's gone through the process who's you know six to 12 months ahead of him and how this whole thing works of course can- he's friends with brendan aronson brendan spells his name with two e's and Caden's name is Caden. They're from the same generation of all okay, these. Okay, that's fair. They're funny. Na- they've, they've, they've got all those names, you know, the Aidens and the Indens and the, you know, like they're all part of the same. No, that's uh, fair. That's fair. But I thought that would be, I, I wonder if they considered that. I'm sure they did about whether the, he, yeah. he could fit into any of these systems. The problem is, I think they're doing him a, a favor by not allowing him to go to RB Leipzig because they are in turmoil right now. They're, they're having a tough time figuring it out. They thought that Jesse Marsh was the problem and they're realizing quite quickly that, hey, wait a second, maybe he's not the problem. The results haven't been great as of late. Now they're going to start kicking in again. But uh, Domenico Tedesco, yes, he's inherited a great team with a lot of talent, but is he figuring out how to get the most out of them? And when you look at their team with Zabaslai, Dominic Zabaslai in that spot, and Kunku has been very good this season. You, you got players that are already in the positions that Caden Clark would be competing for. And I just don't know. You got Emil Forsberg. You, you know, you got all these guys that, all right, he's just going to come and probably just practice with us. And and right now, I think they might be s- saved him a bit to to see that drama. Maybe not. Maybe that experience, we could argue the other the other side of it, that that would be a really valuable experience for him to learn, to see what that adversity yeah, looks like, and see how other pros go through it. But in terms of what somebody said in the chat, it's it's only a good transfer if the player gets minutes and gets to play. Now, I think they have to fight and earn it. I think that's... You know, they, nothing should be handed to them. So there's still an element of that. But it would have been cool for him to go to RB Salzburg as his loan, as opposed to the Red Bulls. Because now it feels like he's going back to the club almost with his tail between his legs, yeah. you know? And I, I'm kind of curious to see how he he overcomes that because he wasn't well, even really playing much I'll there. I'll tell you, the end. he's still getting paid at RB Leipzig wage. That. <laughs> so I think on uh, that on, on that true. context, uh, it's probably not bad. But I, I agree with you. Not so much on the tail between the legs, but I look at it and th- the only downside that I have is when I think about Caden Clark, I actually think about Brennan Aronson in terms of the energy, the confidence. They have this like swag to them on the field where they feel they can take on anyone. And I think that does really well in Europe. And I think whether it was Salzburg or Leipzig, him being in that environment, he seems like, you know, when you had a lot of uh, players throughout the past and will continue to have players that go to Europe and they just don't have the maturity or the character or the discipline or just uh, personality traits that allow them to thrive in environments where they're very uncomfortable, right? Where football is their life. Mm-hmm. And when I think about Caden Clark and I watch the way that he plays and I watch the way that he trains, he seems like one of these guys that wants to be immersed into the, the Red Bull philosophy and the system and train twice a day and be in these environments similar to Brendan Aronson. And so that's the only disappointing part for me. I do think he'd be buried in the lineup for the short term. He's only 18 years old. Mm-hmm. I think 19, 20 is probably a little bit of a safer bet. Brendan Aronson going over at 20, I think he's 21 now, seems a little bit more mature than Brendan Aronson at 19 or even 18. So I think there is time there. I don't think we're losing that. He's going to continue to get games at the New York Red Bulls as opposed to being loaned out some other random place like Melbourne or something like that random where uh it's about he's now got to compete so yeah i i i I, i'm a little disappointed because i wanted to see him challenge himself and i he was one that i have kind of earmarked for a potential slip into the national team for the world cup but i think now there's no chance that he really breaks into the national team over the next year being in major league soccer unless he has a standout like mvp type of year do you do you disagree before we we head on to uh brian reynolds no i don't disagree i think that's you're making some really good points and 
I've got nothing else to add. <laughs> yeah. But That's I, fair. but I, what, I'm, I'm super smart, Jimmy. I'm super you smart. Are. And you so, are. And handsome I, as well. I, sometimes so you just, yeah. Sometimes there's just nothing you can say back, you know? You to, you're you the total gotta... package. I was actually <laughs> looking forward to, to Brian Reynolds a little bit because it looks like he is uh, going to come back to MLS from AS Roma. Now, Roma paid 8.5 million for him, even though That's he had only made 15 starts in MLS. I mean, in comparison, Brendan Aronson went for 6 million to RB Salzburg, which I think is looking like a pretty good deal. After and two eight, full seasons as a teenager. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's just Brendan Aronson. Uh, I, I look forward to getting into our power rankings. I'm curious to see where you put him in the top 10. But but with regard to Brian Reynolds, he needs to play. He needs minutes. And if that's an MLS, he can cut his teeth and get a little bit more well-rounded in that position, then so be it. I don't know how much he's going to cost, if it's a loan, if it's permanent. I don't know what the story is with Brian Reynolds, but he needs to get out of a situation if he can't play. He didn't do well with his one or two opportunities under Jose Mourinho, especially in the conference league where they lost that piece of Ikea furniture, Boto Glint. And he was on the team for that one. And I just don't know if it's working out. I think he's going to learn a ton from this experience, probably more as a human being and probably a little bit as a player too, but he probably wasn't ready to, to make that jump. And, and now I'm kind of curious to see what he does next. And maybe putting his tail between his legs is a bit derogatory and maybe I shouldn't have phrased it like that, but he he gonna have to come back, maybe take one step back to take two steps forward in the future. And I'm curious to see which team he lands and which team wants to take a stab on him, to be honest, because I think he's yeah. gonna be pretty pricey. And again, he's only had 15 MLS starts. It's not like he's coming in with a ton of experience in a particular position if you're one of the teams that needs the right back. Yeah, it's weird. When I think about Brian Reynolds, I cannot, other than little flashes where he's played with the national team and you go, wow, you can see he's got kind of like that mm -hmm. cheeky style of play, technical, quick, explosive wants to get at guys on the dribble. Outside of that, I'm like, I don't know what kind of player Brian Reynolds is. I couldn't tell you what kind of player Brian Reynolds is because I haven't seen enough of him ever, right? Mm -hmm. Where you could see the potential on his full field sprints and runs just the same way that you can see Justin Che right now for uh, you know being linked to a number of clubs as well. You go, okay, there's something there. But you see that from everybody. You haven't seen, I haven't seen any sample size that tells me this player has the ability to take some of this raw tool, some of these, these, these raw goods and turn them into some sort of material and so i think a, a move to mls is, doesn't excite me much to be honest with you i would love to and neither does a move to belgium uh with well, well i see i'm to, seeing to club Brugge and Ander, and anderlecht Anderlec. being another yeah, yeah so but again it's minutes like if he can go get minutes and prove himself i think belgium's a nice but why, why uh, can't a player who was bought for 8.5 million not catch the eye of like uh um someone at psg or not psg sorry that's a little extreme PSV Eindhoven or a Feyenoord or a, or a, um, you know, uh, I access a bit extreme because they don't need the anybody dude's not right moving now. the needle, man. Let's just call it what it is. He's not moving the needle where he is. But he's I'm still, sure. what is he? What is he? 19, 18, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 19, 20, 20, 20 years old. Okay. So he's got to get first team minutes at 20. If you're not playing at 20, that's a big problem. Uh, so maybe MLS is the right move, but I, my, my worry about MLS is, is, is it's getting better, but he's, probably not going to come into a scenario where there's another player in his spot and he's got to compete week in and week out. Now, Roma, there was three in his position. Mm -hmm. And then there was a player coming up underneath him. And that's a really hard situation for a guy to come in with a transfer fee. And then a new manager comes in and goes, ah, not my guy. You know, so uh, I, I want him to be in an environment where he's always chasing somebody and there's always somebody coming up behind him. If not, you're competing with somebody one and one to win that starting spot because he's got the talent. But if no one's going to push him, I always worry about that comfort that comes in MLS because I'm not sure if it's deep enough to really take a player like that and put him under pressure. I don't know. I, I mean, maybe you feel it's deep enough now for him to for him to have that type of uh, environment. Well, but at I, some I, point, I, at some point, we've been around enough. Whether we were teammates with these players or now when we're coaching or trying to advise younger players on what they do, some of them naturally they have they they need everybody has a process of dealing with disappointment and or failure or not playing well. And, and the real simple solution this is pretty harsh, but if you want things to go your way, you got to play better. It's that simple. You have to just play better. If, if a coach is asking you to do something, you just do it. And you, you keep right. your mouth shut. And that's how you earn respect. And you go out there and you do it consistently. You know, if he's asking you to do X, you do X. And you try to be as good as you can at it. And I feel like, and this, is, this isn't this new generation or this is an old guy talking to the, the, I, the old guy doesn't understand. It's always been like this and it'll always be like this moving forward. It doesn't change. It's human nature. But, but, but for the players that complain, at some point you have to stop complaining about what your situation is and just play better. Otherwise, a team and or a coach is going to find a different solution if you're not 
playing well enough to warrant consideration. That's how it works. Does it happen yeah. faster over in Europe where you get less time to figure that out? Yes. That's why there's a big push to get of our American players over here. Sink or swim a lot quicker. In MLS, there's a little bit more time to sink or swim. That, that you do have some time to develop. And that's a fair play to FC Dallas, who continue to do it consistently. Now, that hasn't turned up much success to their first team, but but man, their youth academy is really churning them out. But but now it's this next step of, okay, now you're over there, sink or swim time. And if you can't swim, you're out. And that's that's the way it goes. But now, Brian Reynolds is in a position where I think Ander Lecker Club Brugge is not a bad position to be in, where, okay, I go in there, I go to a league that where some of these teams do get in the Champions League, I help them. If you make your mark there, and you they've proven that at some point Roma, wow, Roma bought that guy for, I can see it. Right now, people can't see why they purchased him for eight and a half million dollars. And he might not be able to see it either because he just doesn't have a lot of experience in the position they bought him for. It's all potential based. So now he's got to go somewhere where he can prove it. MLS, Belgium, but if he wants to stay in Europe, I don't think Belgium at one of those two clubs is that bad of a thing. Does it feel like a step back? Anything he does from this point on is going to feel like a step back. And he's got to get over it and just start playing better. And, and that will help solve some of his problems instead of just bitching. I'm not saying this is what he's doing. I'm just kind of speaking to the general player, not Brian Reynolds. But yeah. but at some point, you got to stop bitching and just go out there and play better. I agree. I mean, the Jose Mourinho situation, my thought was, it was just one that he couldn't control and was sort of the final not, straw yeah, for a player who right. has zero professional games, basically, under their belt. Not even a full season of games under their belt. But we'd love to, to, to hear from everyone. Do you think Brian Reynolds coming back to MLS is better than other clubs around Europe? Do you think he should be making the move? What do you think is the best club for him? But we are going to take a quick break. When we come back, Jimmy and I will uh, discuss our combined uh, Yanks Abroad <laughs> power ranking. Now, rankings, Jimmy, I, we haven't seen them yet. So we're going to probably have a few arguments and some disagreements. And we'll take a look at everything being consolidated right after this break. All right, everyone, we are back. Jimmy, it is time for... Uh, you know, a little bit of an argument, perhaps. Or maybe we agree. We'll find out here very soon. But we're going to go through our top 10 Yanks abroad power rankings. Now, we've compiled a list of our top 10 Americans plying their trade outside of the U.S. The criteria is somewhat vague, but these players are being judged on their form for club and for country. Some are regular starters for the club team. Some are used more sparingly or have just arrived. <clears throat> Looking at you, Ricardo Pepe. Uh, Jimmy, maybe you put him into your power rankings because he's already in Europe and he trained his first training day and that puts him straight into your power rankings. But our producer, Des, has consolidated both of our lists into one definitive power ranking, which will count down now, starting with number 10. Now, our producer is going to put these up on the screen for us. Number 10, Jimmy Conrad. Did you have this? Did you have Cameron Carter Vickers here? I did not. Was and I, I, you know what? Somewhat, I, I regret it in some capacity. If only because you're a, you're a jerk for being a defender. You're a real. Oh, jerk. I am. I am. You know what? I, I when we first did it, I didn't realize it was Yanks abroad. I was thinking just player pool in general. So I was thinking Zimmerman and Miles Robinson would be in my my top ten power rankings. So when when I then pivoted to to this, I mean, it's just because CCV just hasn't gotten into the national team since he hasn't. That I just left them out. But I will say, he's playing well enough for Celtic, even though he had some spots in the Europa League. Right? Yeah, he could have done a little bit better because they did give up a lot of goals specifically to Real Betis, um, as I remember during the group stages. But mm -hmm. but there is something about his game that I like, and I think he's becoming more and more mature, mature as he ages. So that's a pretty good shout. I think I think he's definitely warrants consideration for sure. Yeah. But you I put him in there, I, obviously. Yeah, I had him I had him actually way up on, on my list. And I, I understand, and, and John John's right, the Scottish League is very weak. I wouldn't say it's very weak. He's playing at a club where there's a lot of high, high pressure and high expectation. I will say this. Celtic are expected to win the league every single year. Rangers are now, again, expected to win the league every single year. And both of these clubs have one, one goal, and that's just to win as many trophies as you can. And if you don't, it is a failure. When you lose a game, it is a failure. And what I'll say about Cameron Carter-Vickers is that he's considered one of the best defenders in the Scottish Premier League, or the Scottish Premiership, I think it's called now. And, because, and that is because they've had one loss in his 17 matches uh, that he's been in the team, or in the last 17 matches, only one loss. And again, I know they're meant to beat teams, and they're supposed to dominate, and blah, 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 blah. But I'm telling you, I think that one loss came in the Europa League. Overall, they've been very, very good, and he's been very, very consistent. And when we look at the national team and the way that the national team's been constructed, no one's talking about Walker Zimmerman. He plays at Nashville. No one's talking about his ability to play the long ball, their dynamic range. Cameron Carter-Vickers is a killer. 
He can tackle. He scored a few big goals already for the club. And he does those simple things. If you look at any most of his stats, he gets the ball and he gives it to the player closest to him. And I think there's a simplicity to that that the national team will always need. Now, maybe that means you need to put a, a John Anthony Brooks next to him, somebody that's more comfortable on the ball, somebody who's more comfortable in the build-up play. But what I like about him is that exact thing. Uh, it, it's just that, that simplicity to his game. And we saw that. We didn't want to go with a Walker Zimmerman until we had a Walker Zimmerman. You go, okay, that's not too bad, right? A guy who's good in the air, good on set pieces simplicity to his game makes the game more predictable there's no high highs and low lows there's something about that I mean do you disagree with having a player like that in the team always Jimmy no and I'm looking at the the internet right now and I didn't realize he was only 24 he's got a lot of let's say life experience he's played at clubs all over the place um you know he was signed by Tottenham who I think he's still on uh, under contract yeah. to potentially He's on loan all over the place, but he's... Connor says you can't trust a guy with two last names, Jimmy. <laughs> that's, that's well... The hyphen. That's fair. The I got two I got two first names as names, but I don't know if he can trust me either. <laughs> Sheffield United, then he did Ipswich, Swansea, Stoke, Luton Town, Bournemouth, and now he's at Celtic. There is something to be said for, for him doing well here at Celtic. I'm excited about that, but he does move around a lot. Is that just due to the loan experience and that he's not good enough for Spurs? So he's just got to have to figure out a way we'll to We'll call in an Anthony else. Robinson, though. We'll call in a Tim Ream who are playing in the championship. You can't tell me that playing it's, at Celtic isn't the same. I'm not saying that. For me, it's not even a level thing. It's why can't he stick at any of these clubs? Why do not Why do none of the clubs want to actually purchase him for a bigger yeah. price to make sure that he is a permanent move? I guess that would be. There's a lot of loans, man. And so I don't know. Maybe that's a Tottenham thing that are holding them back. Or, or whatever it may be, but but uh, I'm, I'm okay with this. But he's Spurs only 24. Is, is he's big, got upside. Spurs is a big club, Jimmy. Spurs is a big club. It and is, I think he's going to get bought from Celtic. And I think we're going to look at him in a very different way, in the same way that I think it warrants a call-up. You bring him in. And if he sucks, you don't bring him in again. Okay. No, um, I think he warrants a call-up. I'll say that. Yeah. We're, we're on okay. the same page. Number That's 10, fair. I'm okay. I'm okay with number okay. 10. All right. Let's move on to number nine on these consolidated power rankings, which neither of us, neither of us, neither of us have seen. Joe Scally. Jimmy, did you yeah. have him on your list? I did. I did have Joe Scally on my list. Can I tell uh, you something real quick before you ahead. talk about him? Sure. I forgot him on my list, my first list. And then I swapped him in because I had Brendan Aronson twice on my list. That's how much I like Brendan Aronson. Yeah. I wrote his name twice trying Damn. to put Joe Scally. But I, I got him in. I got him in in my, in my edit. Yeah. So so Joe Scally has played 17 games. So mm -hmm. I think he's the player. Him and Jan Sommer, the goalkeeper, are the only two players from Munch and Gladbach to play in every single game. So that really speaks to the confidence that they have in him, but he was part of this run that they've been a part of. They've lost four out of their last five. They lost 4-1 to Cologne, lost 6-0 at home to Freiburg, lost 4-1 to RB Leipzig, who's not a very good Leipzig team at the moment, lost at home again to Eintracht Frankfurt 3-2, just had a draw 1-1 with Hoffenheim. So yes, as much as we got to give him love for all the good stuff, he's still a part of the teams that are really struggling right now. And not to say that he's fully accountable for all these losses, but he's definitely not part of the solution. And that makes me a bit worried, but anybody's career is going to have some ups and downs, especially as you're a young player and he's going through it right now. So I'm curious to see how he punches his way out of it on an individual and collective basis. So we'll keep your eyes out on Munch and Gladbach moving forward. But yeah, he definitely deserves a call up. 17 games in the Bundesliga being one of the players that are most trusted by a club is a big deal. And, and uh, number nine might be a little bit too low, frankly, but uh, yeah, he's definitely uh, on my list. The only reason I, I'm okay with him at number nine is because, or even 10, uh, if, if he ended up at 10 was because of the fact that he has not contributed to the national team yet. Now that's not his fault, but I would love to be able to judge him based on his form on both sides. And obviously the team's in a bit of a dip at Munchen Gladbach right now. He's getting lots of games mm -hmm. and he's young, which I like, but I want to see him hopefully get some minutes in the national team. I mean, clearly Greg hasn't felt there's an opportunity to put him on the field yet in these, in these games of consequence. So let's move on to number eight in this consolidated power. Dun, dun, dun. Who, Who is it? Got here? I don't even know. No, no, no. That's what I'm wondering. Curious. Anthony Robinson. Listen, I'll go first on this. He has really locked it down, not only for the U.S. men's national team on the left side. I think prior to the final stage here of World Cup qualifying in CONCACAF, there was still a question mark as to who was our best left back. I mean, even during the summer in the Nations League, we had Serginho Destin on the left because it just wasn't that clear. I think Anthony Robinson has locked it down. And then for Fulham, I think he's been solid. So much so that the 24-year-old has been linked to West Ham and a move this January transfer window because Aaron Cresswell is out with a significant injury and, and they don't really have the cover that they want. And Nancy Robinson ticks a little bit more of those boxes going forward. It might be a nice addition. That would be a tremendous move for him to go from Fulham 
to West Ham. I hope that happens, especially because he probably wouldn't have to move because both clubs are in London. So that's something how to take long, into How long is Cresswell out for? Cresswell's out for, uh, let me look it up. But but I just, I really like this. Maybe he should have been a little bit higher based on his performances with the U.S. as well. But but yeah. he definitely should be on this list. Yeah, and... I worry. I, I always wonder about bringing in somebody to replace somebody who's your sure starter, just in terms of the longevity of that. Uh, you know, I had an opportunity to go to the Premier League early on, and I was I, I was being brought in for depth. Uh, and they were they were clearly they were clearly had their first eleven. You know, the player in front of me was was a was an was an England international mm -hmm. at left back, and I was just like. At the time, it was before the World Cup in 2010, and I was like, oh, I don't know if this makes sense to me. And Leighton Baines was was the player in front. He had really sick sideburns, and and uh, <laughs> he was a really good player as well. And he was their sure starter. And I was coming. I, I, I could have come in for depth, but I knew that like I was going to be picking up scrap minutes here and there whenever I wasn't playing, and maybe I could compete. And I believed I could have competed. But when, in terms of the player development, is it right for Anthony Robinson to leave a place where he's getting tons of games, especially in a year like this? To maybe get six months of games and then maybe not get games anymore if Cresswell is back. So that's that's no that's Cresswell, I guess, got a back injury, ran into a post, so he's out for a couple more weeks. I guess it's going a little bit slower than they had hoped. And so, yeah, um, you're right. To your point, you still want him to get minutes, especially in a World Cup year. You don't want that to dissipate at all. But it's a huge compliment. Being it is, it is. Like and that. I think and I think that warrants public. I guess just saying that him being linked to West Ham really speaks to the quality that he has and how well he's been playing this season. Yeah, I agree. I don't. I don't have much more to say on this number eight, uh, other than the fact that I forgot that Anthony Robins, Robinson was also at Everton. He would have, Jimmy. He would have grown up uh, uh, um, just looking up to me, you know, if I ever. <laughs> and then he would have taken 100%. my spot when he was like sixteen, and I would have. Maybe he already he does. Maybe he still yeah. does. Maybe he does look up to you. You don't know. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, anyways, let's move on to number seven in our uh, does. Our, our producer Des is confusing us on the side on, on on our little side chat right now over Cresswell and Chillwell. There's a lot of wells um, <laughs> in the football world uh, that are seemingly injured. Uh, Serginho Des, number seven. Wow, I did not have him on my list at all, Jimmy, um, because he's not playing at all right so now. So I know, uh, I know, I know. I put him. I put him on my list because. I was running out of names, to be honest, as I was thinking about. Dude, by the way, can we take a break real quick? While you're on that exact note, it is a little problematic how little or inconsistent every American abroad is right now in terms I know. of minutes at their clubs. I now, know. I love the fact that when I look back, they're all 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 I know. out of max. But I am very worried about minutes played. And Serginho Des doesn't have that many in the month of December. Now he got an adductor strain. So I believe he played in one game in December and then had the adductor strain, was out for two weeks. And then when he came back, he got COVID. So he's currently out till January 13th. And it was already been clear prior to him getting hurt that they were looking to move him. It was a known thing that they're trying to figure out ways to get funds. I don't know how Barcelona just makes money magically appear. They found $1.24 billion to renovate their stadium. And then, oh, by the way, we needed 60 million euros for Ferran Torres. Oh, also, we're looking at Morata. Like, what? What is even happening? That club's not bankrupt, or at least if they are, they're never going to have to get punished for it. But they were trying to offset some of it. I know for them to sign for on Torres or for him to actually be officially registered, they have to move some players to make that happen. And Serginho Des could be one of those players to kind of fall into the financial fair play rules that exist in La Liga, not over overall in Europe, but it, just in La Liga. So I think Serginho Des could be a target where he goes. Maybe it's back to Ajax, not that they necessarily need him. But uh, that could be a good spot for him to go back to. Obviously, Ajax is playing very, very well this season, Dude, especially he in the played, He thing. played a season at Ajax. He reminds me of the Brian Reynolds situation where, like, he exploded onto the scene and then he was at Barcelona. He played one season. I don't even know if he played a full season with the I Ajax get it, first dude. before he got sold. Like, that's, that's the, the worrying thing to me that they spent this money on him. When you watch him, you're like, Sometimes you're like, this guy's fantastic. He's phenomenal. And the upside is he's being linked to Bayern Munich. I don't know what other clubs that he was being linked to. Uh, I think it was like AC Milan or, or, you know, maybe another club in Italy. I think he was being linked to, you know, a couple other big clubs out there, uh, which could be great. But I just, again, I want him to land somewhere where he's going to play because you don't want him to go to the next place where he doesn't play because he doesn't fit into the system, but they want to take a chance on him. And then yeah. now you find yourself three years later. But I do, I do think that he, he deserved to be on, on my list. He's playing at Barcelona. He's had a rough go over the I last. I mean, right now it's so. the hard. But. It's hard to know. I guess I threw it in there because of his contributions. You know, there. I know it's his contributions, especially that goal against Costa Rica, still yeah. you know having a lasting impact in my brain. 
and and he's hurt right now, so he hasn't really had a chance to to prove to Xavi that, or now he's sick to to that he can be the guy, somebody they can trust moving forward. At this point, Xavi's throwing all kinds of different crap against the wall to see what hits, and he's trying all kinds of young players, getting all their first experience with the first team. And this is a good opportunity for Des to get in there and try to earn some valuable minutes because they still have Mingueza playing right back or Araujo. I mean, there's still a trial by fire at the right back position. Yeah. So I think there's there's room for him to maybe get in there, but because he probably has a pretty decent value, I would say, young American. He's proven himself at Ajax and Barcelona and, and has enough of a track record and sample size to know what you're going to get if you sign him. Mm-hmm. That you could probably get 20, 25 million for him and and feel pretty good about it. So Bayern Munich, I mean, having Dest on one side and Alfonso Davies on the other. Yeah, sign me up for that. That would be amazing. CONCACAF yeah. uh, outside backs. You, but, you, uh, need, you need somebody that's going to work with him. I look at it the same way as Danny Alves uh, was. Like He was really raw when he was first got to Sevilla and somebody had to take a chance on him. Because most of his crosses went out of the stadium. He was out of control. He never defended. He was just frantic all the time. And then he became a world-class uh, kind of wingback or fullback that mm-hmm. kind of revolutionized the game in a different way. And there was a number of players that did that. But somebody needs to invest their time into Serginho Dest because if you don't, you're just going to get the Serginho Dest that we see now, which is flashes of greatness, doesn't defend well, very attack-minded, which leads to good things. But more mm-hmm. often than not, you go, oh, this is a bit of a luxury. Um, anyways, the, the, I want to know what everybody at home thinks that, or whether you're at home or not, I have no idea. It's none of my business, but do you guys think we're idiots? Are we idiots? Maybe we're idiots, Jimmy, but let's move on to the next some number. Days. Uh, some days. Yeah. Some day, we might be getting these wrong, but we might be getting them right as well. That's why we do it. Okay. Number so six, number six is, uh, John Luca Bustio. I, I did not have him on my list and, and I kind of regret it in some ways. Cause I was thinking, would it be pretty harsh to leave a desk off to, to leave off a Gio Reyna who, when they're healthy and playing, you know, are probably near the top of this list, but since they're not, they're not on the list at all. So I was really struggling with that. Everybody, this is our first power rankings, by the way. So take that mm-hmm. all into consideration. Busio, I think has been a pleasant surprise for a lot of people, for people that know him well and what he provides. It's been nice to see him almost make a seamless transition to Serie A that, this isn't a league that was that hard for him to adapt to. And I think that really speaks to his IQ for the game and his quality overall with the ball at his feet. And that he can be successful playing the style that he plays. Does that translate into him being successful with the U.S. men's national team? It doesn't look like he's a perfect fit for what we're trying to build in a 4-3-3 and who we already have available. But I do think that there's something about his game that has opened people's eyes to what he's capable of because he has made that step from MLS to Serie A so easily so i like this ad a lot now i kind of regret that i didn't have him in my top 10. yeah i had him in there at number four i believe i don't know what, how how high i had him um in my in my final rankings but i think it was around number four and and, and what i like four. About, see i didn't even have him at all in my my yeah, top 10. i mean this is this is what's great about it but but busio what i like about him is he, he's 19 years old and i gave him credit for that which i shouldn't do because a power ranking should shouldn't weigh that that's not weighted into it but at 19 years old 16 Syria appearances He's starting pretty consistently uh, in, in Serie A at 19 in a team that's fighting relegation and trying to establish themselves. And they're not super, super deep into the relegation battle at the moment, but they're going through a lot right now. And he continues to be a go-to player in a, in a season that is make or break for them. You know, we're seeing Tanner Tesman work his way in, was sent off uh, recently as well in their last match where Gianluca Busi only played 35 minutes in that game. But otherwise, he's putting in pretty big shifts which I think is a lot to ask of a player this age. And then I think about him developing and that role of a guy who can, I know we want to put in players at the end of national team games that can really like chase the game, Kellen Acosta style, like cover a lot of ground. But when I think about Busio, who can also frustrate an opponent by holding the ball and moving the ball and dribbling the ball and doing things differently in, 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 in ways of, uh, of disrupting and, and, and disrupting the other team's flow in the final minutes where he keeps the ball. And it's not a turnover. And he takes that extra touch to set up a long mm-hmm. switch. And he's got that confidence and, and, and calmness on the ball that I think is different than other players that I hope that he can get to that level, that it becomes an additive thing to put him in late in games as opposed to having to be a super sub because we need attacking or he needs to be a starter because he needs to have this rhythm with the team. So that's my take on that. And that's why I had Gianluca Busio in there. I think I wanted to give him credit for being a teenager starting in Serie A. And, yeah, that's and a great. That's, that's not easy. No, and in a club that's only scored 10 goals, you know, in, in their games, they're still outside of the relegation zone. And and even though maybe his stats don't match up, he's got one goal and two assists to what everybody would like to see. He's more of a rhythm guy, right? He's helping you set the rhythm. He's helping you transition. And the more that he can do that, 
you know, the better off Venezia is going to be in, in trying to be successful consistently. So, and, and he's being asked to, to do some thankless work in midfield, which I think was a big question mark, as especially when he's at Sporting Kansas City, when Peter Vermes tried to change him from basically a 10 to a six and say, hey, we want you to hold the spot a little bit more. And so at times, you know, there's still that learning curve because he is so young and of when to step up and when to drop off. And when you see the best of the best that do it, the like Jorginho's, I throw him out there because they're considering him, like N'Golo Kante, who he's a different player than N'Golo Kante. When I look at Jorginho and I look at Busio, they seem like they're in the same, um, I don't know, a physical level of, of ability in terms of, you know, jumping up to win balls or, you know, N'Golo Kante covers so much ground, so it doesn't feel like a fair comparison. But but with Jorginho, who's a little bit similar in, tell, in terms of like trying to make the game from a deeper position, who's doing well. Uh, you know, I could see some similarities there, but it's that, it's that, that discipline and, and knowing of, and you just have to see repetitions, right? We've been around enough that we were so much smarter at age 27 than we were at 22, just mm -hmm. because we've seen five more years worth of plays and knowing, okay, that's a waste of my time. That's a waste of my effort. When I got to play against, this is my flex of the day. It's almost taken me an hour, but when I got to play against Real Madrid and the Bernabeu and played against Raul and R9 Ronaldo and Zidane and all those guys, I was so amazed and impressed by how efficient they were with their movement. There was no wasted energy with those guys. And I think that's what you learn as you get older and as you see more games and see more plays at a high level of knowing when, when to go and when to stay. And I think Busio is going to continue to learn that. And what I love about him being at Venezia is the same exact point that you made about Ricardo Pepe. He's going to be playing against better players than him almost every week because he's on a team that has to punch above their weight just to survive. And that's going to teach him so much too. He's going to learn a lot about himself and, and what he's capable of and where he wants to go because you start to see, ah, I've seen it now. I, I can see what the game looks like when you're playing a Napoli or a Juve or a Milan. And, and these are what those guys are doing to, to create space and, and to create passing lanes or to block passing lanes, whatever it may be. So this is a big, big, this is good for all of our guys in Europe and anywhere that anybody's playing. But, but uh, yeah, I probably should have had Busio on my list and now I feel bad again. Yeah, That's fair. Well, I want everybody that's watching this to drop your top 10 yanks abroad in the live chat just throw it in there start creating some havoc we start with 10 go down to one as does our producer does uh drops our next number in the power rankings onto the screen which neither of us know about some some interesting uh, arguments oh timothy weah timothy weah in your top 10 this must be only national team contributions it must you know be. what i was swayed by that and he was i think my number five or number six pick i had team away in there because he was starting to emerge not only for us, but also for Lille. He was starting to get some, some, some valuable minutes. He started, then he got hurt and it's been harder to find him to get back into the team. So yeah, he hasn't played well. And yes, I have some recency bias based on how he's he, he always gets e hurt. Evolved. That's my problem. He gets hurt a lot. I know he does. And, and maybe he's fallen into that. Maybe he and Christian Pulisic are drinking the same Kool-Aid and water or whatever, but I just like what I've seen from Team Away, especially with the national team and his confidence and obviously coming off the back end of helping Leo win Liga last season. And that feels more like a lifetime achievement award for 2021 as opposed to current power rankings. But I just wanted to throw him on there. Maybe he's way too high. And you know what? I'll take any heat that's coming my way. But I wanted to put my flag on the ground and say that I think Team Away is a great player and I want him to stay healthy and make sure he gets more minutes for Leo so that he can continue yeah. to dominate for the U.S. men's national team. Yeah, I th I, my only argument against that, because I agree with you, he is deserving, especially for his contributions to the national team as of late. When we talk about power rankings, there that's the whole point is the recency bias of where they currently stand now. I know, Obviously, I know. Has some injury. And I agree with you. And, and, and you're right. When I'm looking at his minutes played, he did have a decent little run where it was 90 minutes, 84, 14 against mm -hmm, Nantes. Mm -hmm. And then he played against uh, Ren, right. 80, and had an assist. And then before that, it was a little bit more spotty where it's 71, 8 minutes, 90 minutes, 11 minutes, 72, 15, mm -hmm. and kind of working his way in as like kind of an every other game starter. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think it's fair. It's, it's a fair argument to, to put well, him in there. There's, there's not, uh, you're not Uncle, you're not Uncle, Uncle Jimmy uh, who gets a birthday present every year from, from Timo for, for putting his name in there. There's some, there's some well, validity to that. Well, Jonathan Akone is going to be moving apparently. And Akone, and I feel like Timo Wea, do fight for minutes. And I think if you wouldn't sell him, if you're Lil, if you thought that you were going to, you know, you didn't have somebody that, that could step up and play. So I thought that was a good one and worth mentioning as well. That, uh, I forgot where Iconi looks like. He, oh, uh, Fiorentina. Jonathan Iconi might be going to Fiorentina. And so that's, that's good news for, for team away. And I just hope that he can take advantage of it once he gets healthy. 
Okay, that's fair. Well, let's move on to number four. We got a, we got a few more. We've kept these people here long enough, Jimmy. Let's let's cruise through our our uh, top four. Brendan Aronson. Now uh, I'll start with Brendan. I, I had him. I, let me let me check where I had him on my original list, just so just so everybody knows uh, where my, oh, I had him at three. He hasn't actually put up huge numbers this year, but he's the kind of player when I think about numbers aside, which is really weird to do for an attacking player who plays a lot of minutes and doesn't put up uh, a lot of goals and assists. Is I just think about when when he's on the field for Salzburg, it's the same as when he's on the field for the national team. If he's out there consistently, the team is going to be better for it. He's going to be the team is going to be better with him on the field more often than it's not. And I think mm -hmm. that is a, a a sign of quality that might not come in the form of goals and assists. And that's why I had him actually at number. I had him. I think I had number number three um, and at number nine. That's right. <laughs> that's just reminding me I had him twice in my power rankings top ten. Um, but did you have him on this list? And where did you have him? Yeah, I had him at number four, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. And for all the all the reasons you mentioned, he makes yeah. teams better. And when he's feeling it and getting the ball and finding good spots, he has even more of an impact. But yeah, we're all big Brendan Aronson fans here. We've talked about him yeah. quite a bit, and and I, you know, expect him to be a, a very valuable contributor to the U.S. Men's National Team. So I just don't think he's displaced the guys that are in the top three. When those guys are healthy and ready to go, it's going to be hard to break into this top three because these are three special players that I'm very excited about who will be leading us and we'll be looking to them to lead us in the World Cup in 2022. So I'm very excited to get into the top three. So let's just get into it, Dad. Yeah. Who's number three? I will say, by the way, while Des is loading this up, Brennan Aronson embodies sort of the modern game, the energy needed to play at the highest level, that peak energy, you know, the ones that we've seen from what we call about holding midfielders now, like the ones that can cover a ton of ground that are setting running records and things like that. Tyler Adams is number three. Wow. I had Jimmy him in two, Conrad. so I don't know what you put him at. Jeez I had, Louise, I had Tyler Adams in two. I think Dez is. I think Dez is trying to get friends. us triggered right now. He's triggering friends, us. Friends, Who'd you have him? Friend, friends helping friends over here, huh? I Who'd mean, have? I, I I have him at number six, and six. Uh, I'll, I'll make I'll make it short as to why I had him at number six. He's actually struggled this year to get consistent six. minutes. Uh, he's been in and out of the lineup. He's only played ninety minutes once in his last uh, six matches. That's a little bit of a skewed stat because he played eighty-one in another one or eighty-two in another one of those matches. But he's been in and out. Even under Jesse Marsh, he was still kind of. Still trying to find his form. Where does he play? We saw before uh, in the old system, he played a little bit of a wing, a wing back in a back five system where he was kind of coming inside and outside, kind of had this drifting role. Uh, and it seems like he hasn't been great. But for the national team, he's he's unstoppable. Well, that's he's, so he's so that's how to get because because so, yeah. I'm pretty sure that you said that the 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 criteria was the the, the combination of how they were playing and their U.S. men's national team form and. We could argue Tyler Adams is the guy for us, and if he yeah. wasn't in the team, we'd be struggling because of all the yeah. intangibles. So I had him higher up my list because I, I think That's my fair. lens was a lot more through the U.S. team and 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 less about what we were seeing in Europe. But uh, no, no, I, I, that's that's. A whole I don't point. know. It's it was like a tough one because a lot of players haven't played in, recently. Yeah, taking them both into account, it's it's tough because you want to give a little bit. You kind of kind of slide the scale out a little bit wider, the time frame a little bit wider, and that's the whole point of these power rankings. And it's also hard when you do a power rankings at the the what's the day? The, uh, it's fourth where I am. The fourth of January, third of January is our Monday show. Uh, it, it's hard when there's players that haven't been. Um, you know, playing necessarily in a couple of weeks now, right? You, power right. rankings are usually immediate, and we're trying to kind of create a little bit of a, a window of time that we can we can call upon these players. So let's go to number two, Jimmy. Uh, let's see what Dez throws up here on the screen for our number two. There's only a few players that this could be. Uh, Weston McKinney. Now, Jimmy, I, I'll give a quick 30-second take on this, maybe even less. Go for it. Weston, to me, like he's playing consistently right now, but the team still sucks for Juventus standards, <laughs> right? They're, they're still losing a lot of games for Juventus standards. But he's still playing at Juventus. He's still playing at a huge club. And he's been one of their better players, at least when he's on the field and playing consistent minutes. And so I had him actually at number two. He's got the clutch gene in the national team. Uh, in the last seven games, he's been one of their better players on the field. Obviously, they're not getting a ton of results. They are, they are doing okay. But again, for Juventus standards, you expect more. But given the current state of the team, I think he's been pretty good. And on the national team, he always seems to find a way to deliver in huge moments. So that's why I have him up at number two. And I think it's really awesome that we have a player that we're bitching and moaning about playing at Juventus. No, I agree with you 100% on that. I think it's unreal in some ways that we uh, have this luxury of having players at top clubs around the world. I don't know 
if Maxi Allegri completely trusts him because sometimes he doesn't start him, even though he usually puts out a pretty good performance more often than not. Maybe I think there's some some positional discipline that he that he at times lacks. I'm not gonna say all the time, but he's not consistent always, and I think that might drive especially Italian managers uh, a little batty because they I think pride themselves on being so disciplined positionally that that maybe a player like Weston McKinney who wants that freedom and that creativity to go forward. It could, you know, and then he breaks the lines with his runs. And sometimes it works out and he scores a great goal. And I'm sure they love that. But when things aren't going well and those runs aren't panning out and he's taking risks that they don't necessarily approve of, that could rub some players the wrong way or some coaches the wrong way or maybe even his teammates, right? But there is something I really love about his game. And he does have that clutch gene. He's He's got that grit, right? Even if things aren't going well, he's still going to fight and scrap and try to be a nuisance yeah. whether he has the ball or not. And I really appreciate about that about him. But... It hasn't necessarily been the best month when he has performed. He was part of that 4-0 game. They lost to Chelsea. They lost to Atalanta the next one. They beat Bologna. He started that and actually played pretty well, 2-0. Then he came on as a sub against uh, Cagliari. And uh, was was the difference? Came in for Rabio at halftime, which I thought was a smart move by Allegri, and it changed the game. And they ended up getting the 2-0 result. So I'm hoping that they lean into him a little bit more. I know there had been talk of him joining Spurs with Antonio Conte uh, in Tottenham. So... That would be an interesting move, and and I'd be excited to see how that looks, uh, even though it looks like Conte's starting to get a better grip of his team. But I don't know. I'm kind of curious about the future of Weston McKinney in particular because, again, he's one of those Americans in the desk camp that could get, like, probably 20, 25 million for him, and I think he would be a welcome addition to most teams, assuming, you know, he's in the right frame of mind and ready to go. Yeah, I actually don't mind him going to, to, to Spurs either. I think that could actually be a decent move for him in the system that they play and him covering ground. He'd probably be more of like a six and a half to an eight somewhere there, maybe less attacking and more of a little mm-hmm. two-way player, more of a traditional two-way player there. But I could see him filling that role, connecting the line. So overall, I'm not, I'm not mad at that. If they want to pay the transfer fee, I think it'd be I a pay- better situation than you. Yeah. Been. I had him at number three, by the way. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's a I had him at two. All right. So let's go to number one. I think we know what that's going to be. Des, unless, uh, is it Gio Reyna? No, just kidding. <laughs> I had Gio Reyna on my list, by the way. I had Gio Reyna on my list. Did Christian really? Pulisic is number one. You're just giving power rankings to guys who haven't played in like months. Well, when he plays, he makes a difference. So I didn't want him to drop months. off the list completely. And so I just yeah, wanted to find it's fine. Honorable mention to Gio Reyna. But yes, Christian Pulisic. I'll start, Heath. I'll say this. Obviously, he had a tremendous goal against Liverpool this past weekend. That's enough to warrant consideration on yeah, any top exactly. 10 list. But I think he solidifies number one because when you do see him play and when he's healthy and he's feeling confident, He's got world-class ability, and I don't think we have any other players in our player pool that do it as consistently as him, that have the fearlessness that he has to run at people, to try to make a difference, to break the lines with or without the ball, and he's a really special player, and I think that he's so special that Thomas Tuchel is trying to play him in different positions to get him on the field because Mm -hmm. his talent's undeniable, and maybe I'm drinking the Kool-Aid a little bit. He does get injured a lot, but he did score the goal against Dos Cicero. Like, he came, and we beat Mexico... 2-0 2-0 in qualifying. He just steps up. He's another player with the clutch gene. We're going to need that in throughout the rest of qualifying and as we get into the World Cup. And and uh, he seems ready for that responsibility. I don't know if he's going to stay with Chelsea. I mean, it's a big conversation to have whether he should should stay or go. I guess it depends on what his options are if he left. But but I like that he's sitting there. He's got to fight it out and he's got to scrap for his minutes and, and he's trying to make the most of it. That's just going to make him uh, more well-rounded moving forward as he gets older. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I think about the clutch gene. I think about the fact that we he's created a monster in us fans because we now hold him to a standard that we would have never even considered holding Landon Donovan to or anybody else in terms mm-hmm. of if he doesn't have a great game for Chelsea, who won the Champions League, we, ho- we, we were kind of disappointed in him. When he doesn't score on his one chance that he gets a game, we hold it against them. And that's the level that we want to get to, right, is, mm-hmm. is holding these Dude, when Clint Dempsey played for Spurs, we used to go crazy. It's so excited just because he got on the field. When Michael Bradley played a game at Roma, we were like, whoa, he's at Roma. Let's go. We are going, we're going to win nothing, but at least we got players playing at big clubs. Now, when Christian Pulisic does something, he set a new standard for us. And, and now players are coming up seeing that. And when I think about him in the national team, I think about him like Landon Donovan, or I think about him like Clint Dempsey, where when you're on the field and you see a player like that, and you can look them in the eyes. You know that when it when push comes to shove, they're going to deliver for you. And there's a trust in that. And of always knowing you're in games, even if you're playing poorly, you have a few of these X factors on the field that in a moment can change the entire game for your team, even if you're having a bad day. And I, I, I look back fondly on memories like that of my career, especially with the national team, knowing that 
There were a lot of days where they weren't going great and somebody stepped up and rose to the occasion and delivered for everyone. You're like, wow, what a relief that you have that type of quality on the field. And that's how I think about him. That's why he's num- That's why I had him at number one. Do you have him at number one as well? I did have him at number one, okay. not only because he scored recently, but because he has been a great team player, I think, for Chelsea, being willing to play yeah. outside of his normal or his best spot, let's say, and and taking on that false nine role. He's got three consecutive 90-minute games under his belt and obviously scored a big goal against Liverpool, which helps. But then he's playing wing back. You know, he's going inside. It's it's He's kind of doing whatever the team asks him to do, and he's 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 trying to make the most of it. So I really appreciate his approach uh, over the last month, let's say, and obviously his impact in the Mexico game to bring in the U.S. Uh, men's national team part of it, the conversation. And I hope that he's ready to get us at least seven points in the next window. As we face El Salvador at home, that should be three, hopefully a point at the minimum against Canada away, and then Honduras at home as well. We're obviously going to have big previews for that on the pod and this YouTube channel moving forward. So make sure you turn on your notifications and hit like and subscribe, suckers. Yep. I like that, Jimmy. <laughs> now, obviously, the team's going to go into a camp early for the players that are available heading into and heading into it, mostly MLS players that are going to be available heading into this qualifying campaign. It'll be in the middle of the month as they, as they lead into – those qualifying matches. Is there any honorable mentions of Yanks abroad that you wanted to throw into this uh, before we wrap up the show? Yeah, I would say Gio Reyna deserves a mention. He's going to get back into form at some point, I hope, and and hopefully get back to where he was. Zach Steffen only had one game in December. It was the loss in the Champions League, match day six to RB Leipzig. Neither goal was his fault, but you know he's still part of it when he got his minutes. But he is playing with some of the world's best players on a daily basis, so that's probably going to make him better in training. And then trying to compete against Ederson as well, I'm sure it keeps him sharp. Obviously, we'd also like him to get more more in-game minutes and go from there. I think that uh, Chris Richards getting his first goal for Hoffenheim and and starting to emerge as as a player that they can trust on a regular basis, I think deserves a mention as well. And then Tanner Tessman starting to get get some more minutes uh, with Venezia. So we'll see. I know he got a red card, so he'll have to wait a little bit. But uh, these games are going to come fast. Uh, and furious here in the month of January. So we'll see if he gets more minutes and hopefully can turn that into some more valuable playing time. So he can maybe push in. There's still, I honestly, there's still one or two players that are outside the player pool right now that'll probably be on that 23 man roster when they go to Qatar and Tessman yeah. could be one of those players. So there's still an outside chance for some of these guys that are, that are pushing to get in. Yeah. And the last, last player I would say honorable mention wise is Eunice Musa. Obviously his contributions to the national team are peak. He's really struggling to find time. Seven minutes. Uh, Listen, at, he's at, played seven minutes in three three games for Valencia this month. Yeah, and then if you add that, if you add that to the end of the last, the, his game before that, he had eight minutes. So eight plus seven minutes uh, is not a ton of time. You add the thirteen minutes before that in the match, and then the twenty five minutes before that, and then the thirty before that, and then the fifteen minutes before that. Jimmy, this guy's playing. I couldn't put very, him in my team. Very, they, they're very very tiny roles, but again, I still look at him in the same context that I look at a number of these players that made it into. Uh, our top 10 that aren't necessarily playing a ton of minutes or, or contributing at the club level, but are hugely important to the national team. I, we got to give them a mention at least because they're going to be yes, of course. so valuable in our, in our qualifying process, especially coming here at the end of the month. But Jimmy, that is it. Thank you so much uh, for the hour and 12 minutes. We hammered through that. We yes, got to the bottom yes. of this list. We got to the, the uh, honorable mentions as well. Oh, We're yeah. going to continue to update these as well as, and, and just a reminder for everyone, Jimmy and I go live with this show every single Monday, one 15 p.m. Pacific time. That's 4.15 uh, Eastern time every single Monday. I'm not going to be here for the next Monday, by the way, but Jimmy's going to be here holding down the fort with a few special guests. So make sure uh-huh. you guys tune in uh-huh. and join that. And we appreciate you guys watching and or listening. Follow K Golasso podcast on Twitter at K Golasso pod. Subscribe to the K Golasso page on YouTube and hit the notification bell, as Jimmy mentioned just a few minutes ago. And of course, subscribe to K Golasso wherever you get your podcast so we can keep giving you guys that content and make sure you comment Make sure you give us five stars as well. We want to continue to bring this to more and more people. And from Jimmy, myself, Des Norris, our producer, thank you guys so much. And we will see you guys very, very soon. We are out. Happy New Year!